everybody. My name is Valia Ewald, and I am a member of the Visual and Performing Arts Department here at Quinnipiac. I teach art history, and it is my honor and great pleasure to introduce to you the moderator of our proceedings here this afternoon, Catherine Marshall. Catherine Marshall was educated at, the Un at University College and Trinity College in Dublin. She has lectured in the history of art at Trinity College and University College and the National College of Art and Design. She has twice been the chairman of the Irish Association of Art Historians. She is now on secondment from the Irish Museum of Modern Art, where she was the first head of collections from 1995 to 2006 and really got that museum on its feet. Um, she's currently co-editor of the forthcoming volume five of Irish Art and Architecture coming out of the Royal Irish Academy. That's just a smattering. Um, she has been involved with many curatorial projects at the Museum of, uh, Irish Museum of Modern Art and as well as many other venues in Ireland and elsewhere. She's brought Irish art to Beijing, for heaven's sake. Um, her publications include pieces in The Atlas of the Great Famine in Ireland, Visual Material and Print Culture in 19th Century Ireland, Irish Women Artists, 1800 to 2009, Views from an Island, Contemporary I Irish Art from the Collection of the Irish Museum of Modern Art, and Irish art masterpieces, to name just a few, as well as editing several volumes, including the 1998 catalog of the Irish Museum of Modern Art. And again, this is just a tiny percentage of her illustrious CV. Um, I think you'll agree that she is eminently qualified to um, help oversee our proceedings here. Um, we are delighted and honored to have her. Please join me in welcoming Catherine Marshall. Thank you so much for that very flattering introduction. Of course, um, when you list things that somebody's done, you can make them sound wonderful. They're very modest, I can assure you. But it's, it's nice to hear them all put together sometimes. Thank you. Um, my job this afternoon is to, is, well, to start by thanking the University of Quinnipiac and Professor John Leahy for inviting us to be here um, to talk about issues to do with representing the famine in uh, the visual arts, that great famine that happened 150 years ago and was only one of um, a number of famines that happened over the course of Irish history and indeed um, histories that are now happening in other parts of the world as we speak. I'd like to start by introducing the artist to you, but maybe it's appropriate to just say a couple of words of what I've just said actually in Irish because the Irish language is one of the things that we lost largely as a result of the famine. The, the language was, a part of, was spoken most in the parts of Ireland that were hardest affected. And, it, and the lesson to people that if they had to emigrate in order to make a living from 1850 or the 1850s onwards, that they were um, hampered if they didn't speak English, meant that there was a big turn away from the Irish language. And that has continued with you know, varying um, ebbs and flows ever since. So, Bwallam Buik as a goal, our son, Halley and Tori, Erinach, Eto, Ochal Ling in Yuv, the Ulskal Quinnipiac, August Gamur, the Professor John Lay, President, Lehi Uktaron, Nhalskalia, our son, on Quira, Hukshay, doing, Beh Uncho, live in Yuv. Um, er on oak, oak, er an oak code special to show on this special occasion, which is, of course, the opening of um, a museum to Ungartha Moor, the Irish, great Irish famine of 1845 to 52. So I'll start by introducing, I'm not going to go back and translate all that, basically I'd said it all already. Um, I'd like to start by introducing the artist starting from the right here. This is John Behan. Um, John Brian Maguire, Robert Bala, Geraldine O'Reilly, 
Alana O'Kelly, Rowan Gillespie on my extreme left. And there are other artists present with us from Ireland as well. Um, if you want to put your hands up as I name you, feel free to. Joe Hogan um, from Galway, um, Charlotte Kelly from Galway, Porik Tuhig from Galway, Megan Farrell, who is the wife, the widow of Michael Farrell, whose work is really um, has a very special place in this exhibition, and we're all thrilled to see it there because Michael sadly died in 2000, and he was one of those people who really kept in touch with a history that a lot of other people found it much too difficult to deal with. So, um, have I left somebody out? Porrick. 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 Yes, oh, Porrick Rainey, yes, of course. Where are you? It's because you're not sitting over there like everybody else. Porrick Rainey, another artist from Galway. All right, then. I thought what we might do, because this is a huge, um, it's a huge subject for us, and it's also a very painful subject for us. Even though it's and, more than 150 years since the event, it's more like it coming up to 170 years now um, since the famine first, uh, the first bit of the potato blight um, made itself, um, made its presence felt in Ireland. But Irish people are still dealing with the trauma um, of the just absolutely excruciating suffering that they went through at that time. And um, of course, many left and came over here and went to other parts of the, of the continent, of the world to live. Um, and, you know, to greater and lesser degrees, we have managed to keep in touch with um, Irish people in other parts of the world and they keep in touch with us. But, you know, with some more than others. And that is something else that I hope we'll all work better at in the future. Um, and this museum will be a great help in doing that. One of the things that I'm very aware of is that Quinnipiac um, has already declared an intention to open a research centre connected with the Great Irish Famine um, to you know, sit alongside the beautiful museum that will be open tomorrow. And so maybe with a view to that research centre and some of the topics that might come up for discussion in relation to our particular bit of history, and the way that history is echoed in other histories around the world um, would be to look at some of the issues that, that we might talk about now over the next hour. So I'm going to just name a few of the things that concern us and invite the artists on my right and left to just chip in and speak about the ones that they have particularly strong views about. Is that okay with all of you? Yes, okay. Okay, and I thought we might, I mean, some of them are, for instance, the effect on Irish identity and Irish self-esteem over the last 150 years of that um, suffering and the emigrations that happened as a result of it, the breakup of um, families, the breakup of the language and communities and so on. Um, I know that some of the artists here are really concerned in their artwork to research and reveal the things that really happened um, in Ireland in, um, and around the history of the Great Famine and the ways in which, of course, and this is something I'm sure some of you will have intuited, the people who survived in Ireland sometimes survived with a great sense of guilt which was passed on from generation to generation simply for having survived it. And yet, you know, Freud said it was uh, the, that the life Trust is one of the two things that, you know, absolutely dominates um, man's existence on earth. Um, another question is why the famine has not been represented in any great depth by Irish visual artists until now, although um, writers have been able to deal with it. Nobody started until about 1950. There was still a hundred year gap. Um, but at least the writers started a little ahead of most of the visual artists, and some of the visual artists in the room might like to pick that one up. Another one that I think um, I'd like to invite the artists to do is to talk about the particular aspects of the famine that they themselves felt most drawn to in their work and why. And finally, if we get around to it, but of course we won't get around to all of this, I know, and other things might well come from you from the floor. Um, but the final one I'd like us to think about is um, how we're using that history and that heritage now. There is a risk, I think, that it could become a sort of tourist attraction. Um, and we don't want that to happen either. So how do any of us deal with our history, whether it's over here in America or whether it's back home in Ireland? 
How do we deal with that history without um, it becoming just something that is rolled out for commercial purposes? It is happening already, and I'm sure we'll continue to. But if you have ideas too, we'd love to hear them. Okay, over to the floor. Would anybody like to start? Robert, yeah, okay. Um, I'd, I'd like to pick up on this, uh, the, the question of representation of the famine, particularly at the time, and the fact that there was, there was so little uh, done. Uh, I, uh, I think that fits into a, a much greater, longer pattern than just uh, that period uh, in the middle of the 19th century. Um, for obvious historical reasons, um, artists did not portray Irish history in any meaningful way. Uh, I think the reasons for this are uh, really obvious in that art requires, other than art, other art forms, art in particular requires patronage, requires support. And the Irish people who would have done that actually left Ireland after the, uh, after the Battle of Kinsale, the defeat in the Battle of Kinsale, and the Irish chieftains who had effectively, and their clans had run Ireland uh, for years and years, left and were replaced by a new settler class who were brought in. And I think you could say that uh, the content of Irish art for the next 400 years was effectively determined by this Anglo-Irish settler class who were a very interesting bunch entirely. I just wrote down a quote here, which I think is interesting because for a start, I mean, obviously they weren't native Irish, so they didn't have the interests of the native Irish at heart, but also they, they actually weren't that interested in art either. And in an important book called The Painters of Ireland by Anne Cruikshank and the Knight of Glynn, in the introduction, there's an interesting quote, and I wrote it down because I think it's interesting. They say, a country gentleman would have deemed it more important to keep his horses and hounds in palatial luxury rather than order a landscape of his domain or a portrait of his wife. So there wasn't a lot of work there for Irish artists. Also, um, I think it was in 1690, uh, Charles II introduced a charter uh, for painters and stainers in Ireland. It was called the, the, the Guild of St. Luke. And the, 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 the rules for admission were that you be of good conversation on a, and the Protestant faith to practice as an artist in Ireland, which that kind of ruled out about, what, 90% of the population? <laughs> so uh, it was a hard struggle to have uh, Irish history, Irish themes presented in art. And then I think the really crucial thing was 1801, the Act of Union which had a traumatic effect on Ireland, and particularly, I think, in the cultural sector, that up to then, I mean, in the 18th century, Dublin was the second city of the empire. And after the Act of Union, that whole, particularly that cultural gravity, moved to London. So all Irish artists who, you know, some of them absolutely superb artists, did not practice in Ireland, they practiced in London. You'd uh, artists like uh, John Foley, who I would consider one of the greatest ar Irish artists of all time, uh, was the sculptor for the empire. And Daniel MacLeese from Cork painted the murals in the House of Lords. But it's interesting to look at their themes. Uh, uh, MacLeese's uh, great mural was of the death of Nelson, and uh, Foley paint, uh, sculpted the Albert Memorial in London no Irish themes going on there at all. So I think it's not surprising that there was so little work done on the famine. And I'll finish off by just quoting two things that I think are interesting. An artist called R.G. Kelly, who um, painted a picture and exhibited it in Birmingham, uh, and it was an eviction scene. Uh, he had the embarrassment of discovering that he was actually criticized in the House of uh, commons for painting such a picture. And then some years later, in 1890, uh, Lady Elizabeth Butler, who is probably one of the most famous painters of battle scenes and that sort of thing, uh, painted um, uh, an eviction scene as well. And there was a huge negative reaction in London to this. 
So it was neither popular nor profitable for uh, Irish images of the famine to be painted or uh, uh, created. And, and, and finally, I'll say, that as far as I know, and Catherine would have know much more about this than me, but as far as I know, there's only one contemporary, a relatively contemporary painting of a famine scene in an Irish national collection. And that's a painting in the Irish Folklore Commission by MacDonald of the, of the discovery of the potato blight. And as I understand now, and again, I could be corrected, that painting was gifted to them by Cecil Woodham Smith as a thank you for the information that they provided to her in researching her wonderful book, The Great Hunger. That's correct, yeah. Okay, um, well, that was a good run through the, 19th, the period up to the end of the 19th century. Maybe, Geraldine, you might like to say a bit more about that? Uh, well, do you want to ask me a specific question? Well, <laughs> Bobby's been talking about why Irish artists didn't represent that history up to 1900 or so. Um, do you want to say anything more about the research you've done on, um, on artists in Ireland since then, on people who emigrated, on why they couldn't make art and um, prosper with it at home in Ireland? Well, I mean, I, th I, I agree with Bobby. I think there was no patronage. You know, like w once all the landlords and everything moved after the Act of Union to London, there was no patronage. And I mean, it was incredibly poor. Like this morning we were talking about, there's a book that has come out recently about German travelers in the 19th century coming to Ireland and uh, traveling the country and discovering that it is so poor that it is beyond their imagination how poor it was. So you can imagine you hardly are going to indulge in the fine arts when you're surrounded by such poverty. You haven't got the money to, for the materials and so on, you know? I mean, my, my interest in it came around in a kind of a circuitous way. Like when you grew, in the era that I grew up in Ireland, you know, the thing that used to bother me was um, that people said that we were almost genetically coded to emigrate. You know, to be Irish was, you know, you had to take the boat and emigrate. And I always was very interested in challenging notions because, like that, because unless you explore it and find out why that is so, um, or if that is actually true, you can't really change anything. So by accident, I came to New York to work as a mural painter, and we were doing murals uh, with a company called Art Makers, and we were doing murals which you know, explored other ethnic groups. And the people I worked for said, we don't know anything about your history, Geraldine. So I wound up researching uh, Irish American labor history to make a mural to put it on the Irish Arts Center. Now, it never actually happened, but then I came home and I applied for a Fulbright, which I got, and then came back and worked in the Tabernet Library in NYU researching um, uh, uh, the history of the Irish from the 1840s onwards. And it was a revelation to me, you know? And I mean, the thing that I think too about growing up in Ireland is that because you, you, oh no, I should say before that, that I discovered the reason I was interested in the famine was that prior to the famine, the Great Famine, um, um, you know, people didn't divide their property, even if it was a small holding. Um, you know, as many children would marry and marry young and the property, the little fields would be divided. And because they had the potato and milk and the rest of the food that they produced was exported, but they could, they could subsist on, on that. But the famine altered that. People were terrified after the famine, so inheritance uh, went down then. The eldest son got everything, you know? So emigration then was really one of the, um, what would be the way out or the way to survive. And that's where, say, among the Catholic population, that the real emigration from that sec sector really originated. I mean, there was emigration from Ireland previous to that, but it would be Protestant or Presbyterian. Uh, Methodist, you know, you know, um, and um, but the, like I remember reading at one time saying, you know, peasants don't necessarily, they're so attached to their land that they don't want to leave and it would take something very catastrophic to move them and, 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 that, and that's really what happened and once I learned that, that it wasn't inevitable that we always had to emigrate out of, you know, uh, I, I became very interested. The other thing that it also uh, kind of got me involved in was um, I started reading about all the Irish that came to America and what they did and what they got, in, got involved in. And I, I felt a great loss in a sense because in many cases they were my aunts and my uncles 
and my cousins and so on, but I never knew what they had done in America. And because we were a nation of so many emigrants, uh, but in school we weren't taught about I felt that was our history too, sure. and, and, and we didn't know anything about it, so there was this missing big link. I'm going know? to interrupt you there, Geraldine, because I want to get, bring Brian. Yeah, sorry. But just to say on that point, the new uh, five-volume history of Irish art that the Royal Irish Academy is about to publish will contain a chapter on diaspora artists, because half of our history, more than a lot more than half of our history, happened outside of Ireland, mm. and it's time to gather it together and bring it all home, I think. Just, Brian. just could I just say one little thing uh, in, that's interesting in the context of, you know, the artists who left Ireland because they felt they had to, mm -hmm. uh, but the, and the ones that went to London were circumscribed because of the essentially anti-Irish feeling to, to not including Irish subject matter in their work. Uh, the artists who came here uh, to the States had, had, had a quite a different uh, experience, experience. Mm -hmm. and uh, you know artists like uh, William Hartnett uh, I know I've seen a still life of his I think in the Met and it has a, a banjo and Irish sheet music on mm. the uh, a very Irish themed picture so being Irish in the United States as far as I could see as an artist was not as disadvantageous as having an Irish identity in London at the time. Sure. Could I just sure. say one other thing, just to, very quickly, sorry, just about women. Yeah. One thing that I discovered in my research, that at peak times of emigration, because we're always pictured that it is the man who is the emigrant, and what I discovered that at peak <laughs> times of emigration after the famine, it was mostly women. You know, it was, you know, there was a higher proportion of women who emigrated. And, and the unusual thing about Irish women is that they often traveled on their own, not in the company of men, and that a lot of the emigration came through the female line, you know? So hence, I think that's why America has some very, you know, sort of strong, independent uh, women, you know? <laughs> Hooray. Okay, I'm going to ask Brian to um, add to this because I'm concerned about the 20th century. You know, we can talk about patronage and we can talk about colonization, and I've done this and written a lot of the stuff that you've cited as well, Robert. Um, but there is the fact that Ireland became independent in 1922. And for years, I think the shame of the poverty and the inability to just sustain communities in Ireland meant that they just still couldn't address that history. So I don't know if you'd like to uh, yeah. that, Brian. Um, there's a couple of things. Every, every time somebody says something, I think of something else. <laughs> and uh, I just remembered Kennelly, who wrote uh, Schindler's Ark. Who's, what's Keneally, his name? Thomas Kennelly. Thomas, Thomas Kennelly. Yeah. Australian. Yeah. He had a, he had a line, he wrote a book about, I think, called The Criminal American. Or, I, 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 I'm hopeless with references, but I do remember the content. The content was a line at the beginning when he said that from Soho down to Battersea Park, or, uh, was a red light district in New York in the middle, in the 1830s. Half the girls came from the west of Ireland. And nobody in this room, I'd say, that hadn't read that book is aware of that. This is the fiction we build for ourselves. I grew up in a land of saints and scholars. Yes, I agree. You know? Sin was something which existed in England. Anyway, so... <laughs> So that's the, just came back into my head. Um, you're talking about poverty. Poverty is very real, and we're all ashamed of it. There's no way, my grandfather was born in 1850 in Fermanagh. There are photographs from around the 1850 of neighbors of his, not necessarily his house. And these houses are cut into the side of hills. You wouldn't keep cows in them today. This is, this is the reality that was left after the flight of the Earls. So poverty and poverty continued. The biggest reason that you have art now, in my opinion, made about reality in Ireland was Danica O'Malley's introduction of free second level education in 1960 in Ireland because that opened the way for people like me to go to college. And I, I think that's 
why, yeah. why things are the way they are. Um, so let, let, me, let me leave that. I had other things to say and I've forgotten them. But I wanted to, you, you, at the beginning you said if we had some take on this, we, sure. <laughs> we, we could talk about it. <laughs> I, I have a take on it. Uh, the famine, I'm not, I haven't been that interested in trying to reach the famine because it's hard. There are no photographs, there's no visual information. You have to make it up, and I find that difficult. What I don't find difficult is to understand the moral responsibility of the then British government in relation to this famine. There was food, it was exported. Recently, from working in Mexico and working in relation to the drugs business, I, I went back to the 1850s and found out that when the Irish famine was on, the British government invaded China. The reason for it was the Chinese government decided that the opium addiction of its people was devastating for its people, and they wanted this business to stop. The British government was importing tea and silk, had a balance of payments problem, and the only way it could solve it was sending an army in to protect the drug dealers. Now that's the fucking, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that's the moral responsibility that existed in Ireland in the 1850s. Um, as regards it becoming a tourist attraction, God help us. Um, if, we don't, if we know our history, the, the thing is, if you don't know it, you repeat it. One of the things coming here, to, and I want to commend the university for this, I was kind of thinking, wouldn't it be great if they made a research centre around this issue. And when we arrived here, information, by the way, is held very carefully in Quinnipiac. They told us nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but the research centre is there, and you're to be absolutely commended. It's the first museum that I've known to have established a research centre on the day it opened. And that gives me great hope for this. Thank you. John, would you like to say anything else about that? Uh, Yes. Uh, Can you hear me? Yeah, I didn't get hooked up. Um, yeah, well, um, <clears throat> the, um, the thing that I uh, tried to put into the work, because unlike Brian, uh, I always felt deeply about the issues of Irish history and the famine. And when I was at school in the Christian Brothers in Dublin, uh, one of the things <clears throat> that struck me was the complete defeat of the Irish people in the 19th century. They were utterly devastated and wiped out. And I used to get depressed hearing the history lessons. Um, and I, I, I was one of the many people who could not face up to the fact of a devastation such as a famine. On the other hand, as Brian and, and Robert have, have uh, <coughs> described in Geraldine, the <coughs> Famine is not inevitable in the course of history, of human history. It is the cause and effect, usually, of neglect by those more powerful than those who are uh, administered to. And that's what happened in Ireland. There was this, uh, it was like Margaret Thatcher in the 1990s. There was an open market effect on the lazy Irish who couldn't get off their backside and do something for themselves. These people were totally incapable, as the people all over the world today in living in third world countries are incapable of looking after themselves. And that's a very important aspect of famine. Now, my um, <clears throat> approach to the famine as an artist was the same thing that James Connolly said. He said, Ireland to me means nothing without the people. It's the people who are important, not the abstractions of government, of finance, and all the rest of it. It's the actual fact of the matter that the people are the most important thing to look towards. And that's what I've tried to bring into the um, business of my involvement with the famine as an art subject. Um, and then, of course, what happened 
due to all these effects of historical circumstances, which other people have touched about, was that you had emigration, mass emigration. Millions of people died as a, as a, a quarter of the population. Can you imagine any uh, historical uh, statistics prove that even today, there are no more uh, devastating statistics than that of the Irish famine. And in terms of um, statistics, it was the worst famine, um, certainly in Europe of all time, and possibly in the world. So you, you can imagine what this means <coughs> to the people. And in terms of emigration, it al also means immigration. So where did they immigrate? They immigrated in vast numbers to America, to Australia, uh, to Britain, and to other places like um, Argentina and so forth. <clears throat> the inevitable <clears throat> aspect of that I've tried to put into my work, and um, as I say, to me, the people are the most important thing, and uh, that's, that's my um, kind of con conclusion today. There's much more to all of this. And there has been a book, I don't know if anybody has a copy, but uh, it's called and published by UCC, which is University College Cork. And it's, it's, the, it's the most comprehensive study of the famine with all the facts and figures. And it's called uh, An Atlas of the Irish Famine. And uh, everybody who has any interest should get a copy of that book. Um, that's where I leave it at the moment. Thanks very much. Just to pick up on something John said there, the um, Nobel Prize winning economist Amrit Sen said that famines don't happen in countries that have a democratic government. So I think that's worth thinking about because you don't elect people who then, um, you know, starve you to death. Put you in a position where you can only starve to death. Yeah, they, they take, make some measures to try and mm -hmm. um, alleviate situations like potato blights when there's other food they can give the people instead and so on. Um, I'm still concerned about what's ha what happened in Ireland. I mean, education, uh, which Brian mentioned, was definitely a factor, but there were other reasons too why I think the Irish just found it too painful to deal with. Think of Adorno saying about um, the Jewish Holocaust, how can you write a poem after Auschwitz? In a way, that's um, the kind of thing that I think has held Irish people back as well. Um, Alana O'Kelly has been looking at ways of just grieving for the dead, mourning the dead in her work. So I think maybe Alana, you might have a few things to say. Sure, sure. To add to this. Um, I, yeah, I, lots of things. Um, I think just to start, I, 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 was, I found myself living in London in the mid 80s. And I found myself having conversations with people my own age and in the college I was in, the University of London. And I found what, um, I had a conversation with Declan McGonigal at one stage and he, he called it a willful ignorance. And I thought that was a really interesting term for what I was trying to, trying to describe. Because I think there, there certainly was and maybe still is an incredible willful ignorance um, on the part of the British about what was happening. I mean, the mid-80s, there was a war on in, 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 the, in, in our country. And to try and talk about anything that was going on, if, if, if a conversation started about anything that was going on in Ireland, everybody went silent. You know, it was like nobody knew, even knew how to talk about it, or they were afraid to talk about it, or felt very guilty about it. And, you know, so, so I realized at that stage, and actually what happened was my, my work kind of stopped at that stage. And I, I started realizing that I had to, I was desperate. I had to start looking at our own history, you know, in the face of, of, of everything that was going on. And I had to start looking at it. And, and my idea was that I would make, make a body of work that I would bring back to England to start a discussion going, you know, to start some kind of conversation going. Um, but it was really out of desperation. I, I, um, I don't know if I'm going off the point now, but I, you know, it, it, it felt, I, <coughs> I, I felt desperate to actually go and look at. And when I did look at it, I realized the famine, you know, the famine was the thing, the, the, the great hunger was a thing that I really felt I needed to, to get some handle on in some way. And I think, you know, 
we didn't talk about the famine that much in our household. You know, I, I, I remember my granny and I remember my, my parents and we would talk about all kinds of things. The Irish famine wasn't spoken about. Do you know, it wasn't spoken about any, you know, and it wasn't up until very recently that people have started digging. I remember reading at one stage and somebody said, you know, there's, there's tons of material, but it's under, what was it? It was under dusty spaces, you know, on shelves in dusty spaces. And that was the feeling that I had, that the material, yeah, is there, but it, it, it hasn't sur resurfaced. Do you know, it was that mm. kind of feeling. I'm going to bring you back to the question I was trying to get Sorry. you to answer, Alana, for a second. No, I think everything you're saying is really mm. relevant, but it seemed to me, I do think um, that the silence that Alana is talking about was a major factor, and it is to do with trauma as well. The people who have suffered most can't talk about it. I heard somebody talking about, um, yes, Richard Carney, the philosopher, gave a talk in Dublin um, about three or four months ago, and in the course of that talk, he talked about somebody who had insisted on interviewing some Holocaust survivors who had never spoken about their experience in Auschwitz. And the, he went to whoever the researcher was or the writer was, met two survivors who are now very old people and asked them about their experience. And they very reluctantly, under pressure at that point, talked about it. Mm. They each committed suicide afterwards because they had, they couldn't deal with it. Mm. And so, <coughs> Maybe it's not surprising that people bury such awful experience and it becomes buried then for the next generation and the next and it's only after a good bit of time has elapsed that people can start to deal with it. Anyway, to come back to Alana's work, I think where you, interestingly, as far as I'm concerned, looking across all the work that has been made about the famine in Ireland, in the visual arts, what I thought was interesting about your work was that you um, identified the need to mourn and just keen for the dead mm. and say, you know, we love you, but you died. And I think that was really important. I personally found that a bit liberating. Now, a bit liberating, because that's mm. each bit is only a small stage. But I felt as if it opened up a space where we could begin to talk about it. So would you like to say a little bit about that? Well, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's like any death. I don't, you know, I think if you don't, if, if you don't mourn it and you don't deal with any death, you know, however close you are to, to that passing, uh, I think it's very, very difficult perhaps to deal with it. And so it seemed to me really important and really essential that I would do that for myself. You know, out of all the reading, and the reading is heavy going, you know, it's heavy oh, it's going stuff. It's yeah. really, oh, yeah, it is. And, you know, so it felt incredibly natural that that, yeah, of course, that's what we have, you know, that's what I have to do. That's what we have to do. And so that was one of the first pieces that I, that I did was a, a series of keening um, that I created. So it was, it was, it was, it was based, on the, on, based on, on the Irish Queen of, Queen of Namorov, but it was a contemporary keen. Um, so it was a contemporary piece of work, a sound, a sound installation based on that. Um, yeah. Good, important. You want to talk, and I know you do, and I'd love to hear you again, Bobby, but I'm going to ask Rowan okay. first if he has anything he'd like to add to what we've all been I forget what part. I was going to say. <laughs> Hold us here, right, if you want uh, to pen. You can so, note it down. There's so many things to sort of pass by now, and I keep thinking of different things I would say, but the, the main thing I'm coming up in, with, in my mind is that I came into the whole famine project in a different way from anybody else here, in that I come from a family which did emigrate, emigrate. My great-grandmother emigrated. My grandmother went back to Ireland. Mm -hmm. Then when I was born, my parents emigrated. So I was brought up in a kind of war-torn Cyprus and sent to boarding school in England when th things got too difficult in Cyprus. It was too risky to have me there. So I was educated in my history in an English Quaker school with an Irish history teacher, and the famine was never mentioned. And in my home, which was then, my parents had eventually moved to England for the final stage of my father's career, the famine was never mentioned. So I did rather like my grandmother. I returned to Ireland and set up my 
career there. And when the famine project came up, I probably had very little knowledge about it all. So my research was really a journey of discovery. And I think the, the amazing thing, the sort of shame, the not talking about it, my, parent, my grandparents in Ireland never talked about it. And I went through the whole thing of the horror of the food being exported at the same time, you know, five ships going out as one came in, and the concept that this was a gross act of genocide, mm. and the conflict of having been educated in England, and suddenly finding that I was hating the people who educated me because of this act of genocide, and then gradually coming down to thinking, actually, it wasn't genocide. It was just gross neglect. You read Charles Dickens, and you see what London was like at the same time. Mm -hmm. and, and so then I think gradually I started to get a little bit more balance on the whole thing. And probably, like I do believe many of you here and others in the room, I think did my best work on the famine because I gradually found my way with it. But my family, my father in particular, as I was telling some people at lunch today, when he heard that I was doing a sculpture of the famine, he did everything possible to stop me. And he would not talk about it. When the sculpture was done, I said, the sculpture's finished now. Would you? It, he was in a, in a home at the time. And he wouldn't hear me talk about it. I said, it's, but it's really successful. He would not talk about it. He never saw a photograph of it. He died never knowing the piece I'd done, which kind of hurt me a lot. But this shame, Mm -hmm. that you're talking about, that has to be shame. It's a family that was going away, coming back, going away, coming back, but the shame was deep. In 1945, in Dublin, exactly 100 years after the first um, outbreak of the potato blight, there was a, a big exhibition in the National College of Art and Design in Dublin. It was to be, the, you know, the first exhibition that the state really decided to have an input into um, in which they would look at Irish history. Now, what's the most obvious topic to deal with in 1945? If you're looking for a historical subject, I would have thought the famine. They couldn't deal with it. They decided that they would call the exhibition the Thomas Davis um, commemorative um, exhibition. Thomas Davis had died in 1846. So one, 99 years after his death, they had an exhibition for Thomas Davis they couldn't deal with the famine. Now, as it happens, Davis in his time had you know, called on Irish artists to deal with their own history anyway. So in some ways, it was very appropriate that Davis was the fallback. But it's something I find personally really hard to deal with, that you know, 30 years into independence, we couldn't do that for, for our own people. Um, but I suppose I wasn't there. We're a generation later. We've, we are that little bit further removed from the, the suffering. Bobby, you wanted to say something else. I'm sorry. I, I want to try and uh, tease out this issue. Yes. And I think maybe what I'm going to say could be very controversial. But certainly in my experience, I've found that, uh, for instance, in the United... I've, it's a topic I've been interested in for many, many years. And in the United States, I've never found any real resistance to dealing with this subject, talking about this subject, because, you know, I'm talking about Irish America essentially here, because you know, the majority of Irish Americans, certainly those who emigrated in the 19th century, arrived here as a consequence of the famine. They were victims of the famine. And they were all kind of largely interested in this history and discussing this history. The, dif the, di the difference in Ireland was quite dramatic and uh, this kind of denial. And I believe, and words have been used, like guilt and shame. And, and the reason is that whereas the people in America and Australia are very clearly victims of this event, in Ireland, the people who are in Ireland were the survivors of this event. Mm. And I think a lot of the survivors were actually people who profited from the event. And that's a very, uh, very terrifying thing to admit to, that your ancestors actually might have benefited 
from a situation that a million people died and a million people were forced out of the country. You know, that's a big price for your, uh, your success in life. And by that I mean, you know, somebody who uh, suddenly discovers that, uh, the, the, you know, the small tenant farmers could no longer sustain their, their property and left, and they just quietly extended their property and became slightly bigger farmers. Uh, others were, you know, quite definitely involved in the role of the authorities, land agents, policemen, all these sort of people. So in Ireland, I think the situation is actually historically much more complicated than it is yes. probably in the United States or other countries where Irish people went to after the famine. And as you say, uh, I mean, things are becoming, uh, you know, freer now, but how many generations have had to pass before yes. we can start to face up to this huge trauma, in fact, probably, you know, the, 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 the greatest trauma ever to afflict Ireland in its entire history. I think on that concept that you're talking about there with the, the, the complexity of the situation in Ireland, as, I, as we were coming up in the bus to the museum now, I sort of, in one way, thought, how does this museum come to be here? Well, actually, you're answering that very question. It would have been quite difficult to put it in Ireland. It would have been incredibly controversial because we're probably not ready to have it in our own territory. But it's the people here will actually understand this mm -hmm. better than back home. Maybe not better, but it, makes, it does make sense having that museum here. And we do funny you things. Get, you get with the immigration in a place like Toronto, for example, at the time of the famine, you had a population in Toronto of 18,000 people, and they took in 48,000 Irish immigrants. Now, for any of us today to think of famines around the world in our cities, who would do that today? There were incredible acts of generosity mm. on this side of the Atlantic. Unbelievable. Mm. So there's also hope and, and positivity within this, of that, that human care that came yeah. in mm. Toronto in particular. Brian, I, you to... I think you've hit on something here where it's, it's easier not to look in your own back garden, mm. That's but it. That's to look in your neighbor's back garden. Yeah. It's a lot easier to, to to be a, to research as a stranger is much more objective. Um, yeah, my neighbour's terrible. You know, <laughs> one of the problems in Ireland when the war was on in the 80s was that if you made work about it, you actually became a player in it. Mm -hmm. And in, in, I, th I think the last part of the discussion is part of the answer as to why this isn't the strongest topic in, in Irish art. Mm. Well, and that goes with a feeling of guilt about it, the survivors yeah. having possibly profited or somebody in their family did. Um, I'm going to suggest that um, people in the audience might have points you'd like to raise or comments you'd like to make about it or questions, because we only have a few minutes left. Yes. Um, sorry, if I can just hold you for a second. Great. There are microphones behind you. Would it be convenient for you to get back to one? Or can you hear? Does he need to do that? No. Fine. Go for it. While you were talking, I was thinking of the, the famine in China when 40 million people died. You know? And you might know about the book by Kerderer. I think it's uh, Eric Kerderer, about the great famine, the great Chinese famine. And then I'm thinking in Bengal, you know, uh, what was it in the 30s or 40s when millions and millions died. Now, coming from our own societies, um, we somehow don't have the depth to see that the same thing would happen, that generations and generations later, they still can't come to grips with it. We have some sort of notion that in third world countries, where they just sort of turn around like that, mm -hmm. just become what they were before. Then, of course, I think of Rwanda, you know, or yeah. the, the opera, the opera. These places, if you went there, would you find similar phenomena of people being unable to speak about it, people being unable to have a museum or an art exhibit 
about these things, or do you find cultural attitudes whereby, you know, it's the four horsemen of the apocalypse, you know, it's famine, disease, war, death. So this is just one thing among others, and they just recover. Now we'll be curious to see what it, how to compare those countries with what's happened in, in Ireland. Yes, and that's research that is still to be done, I think. We're only at the discussion stage. I mean, there is an, an interesting issue as well about monuments to the Great Famine. And we've all, um, lots of people in this room have been involved in creating monuments like that. But there is the notion that as soon as you build a monument to something, you say it's over, it's finished. We don't have to talk about it anymore. And we are, this discussion is enough to prove that that's not the case. We still have a lot of unfinished business, all of us, to do in just accepting what really happened at the time. And, and of course, that's the same for all of those other societies where this has happened. I think, yeah, and colonization remains a factor in all of those as well, or imperialism. Yes. Yes. Uh, one, one thing, uh, one project that I'm involved in uh, here in the States is uh, a legal tribunal into the famine, which is going to take place in Fordham University. And this is the first time I think that there's going to be, the famine is going to be looked at, the Irish famine is going to be looked at from a legal perspective in terms of looking at uh, the causes, the, uh, how the authorities responded, did they respond efficiently or if they uh, responded inefficiently, you know, what does that mean? Does it mean, uh, you know, uh, as Rowan uh, said, uh, uh, initially genocide, or is it neglect, or what is it? Because we actually haven't defined that at all yet. So uh, I think that this is going to be quite interesting, you know, because we've had, our, we've had artists here talking about the famine, we've art historians talking about the famine, uh, historians talking about the famine, but lawyers have actually never looked at the famine, and never. And it, it, it's quite interesting. I mean, one lawyer, a, an Irish lawyer who's working in New York, um, has quite an interesting uh, notion, and I don't know if he's going to present it at this tribunal, but uh, the, uh, what he argues is that international law dealing with issues like this, of course, didn't exist in the 19th century. In fact, they only became international law after the Second World War and the Nuremberg trials where genocide uh, crimes against humanity were defined, uh, and uh, he wants to argue that the, this legal definition really just legally reinforced moral conditions, that these, these crimes were always crimes, but they weren't legally recognized as crimes. So he's hoping to be able to argue legally that those sort of crimes which are you can prosecute today in the world, they're doing it in The Hague at the moment, can be retrospectively applied <laughs> to crimes committed in the 19th century. So I think that would be controversial and quite interesting. So uh, if, when this takes place, I hope uh, a lot of you might find it interesting to attend. Okay, we're going to take one more comment from the floor. Yes. All right. um, my name is Turlo McConnell, and uh, I have a question for John. Uh, John, I, I, if I remember cor uh, correctly, um, you said as a young artist that you worked was it was it Edward Delaney who created the wonderful sculpture on Stephen Screen? Yeah. yeah. Yes. And and I wondered, and and that uh, that to me is the first famine memorial that I had ever experienced as, as uh, period. And uh, I was always struck by that wonderful piece. I was always struck that it was behind that wall, mm. that you know Wolf Tone was there front and center. And then somehow behind that wall was this wonderful sculpture. And I wondered, now that we are so familiar with other monuments in Ireland and here in America, uh, what it was like creating that, that sculpture at that time in Ireland when you, when you worked on that? Uh, yeah, I worked with Eddie Delaney uh, on that piece. Uh, it was cast around 1965, 66, around that period. Um, Eddie himself has said that he was commissioned to make a sculpture of Wolf Tone, and he did it in collaboration with an architect called Noel Keating. Um, Eddie has passed away in the last couple of years, so he's no longer <laughs> around to talk about it, but uh, I did work with him, and he said 
Now, the, the wolf tone um, statue, which he made as a commemorative statue, to his, the memory of wolf tone, was made as a single commission, and he added the famine himself as a statement personally later on. And um, it was the first piece of sculpture that was made on any kind of a scale in Ireland. Uh, Eddie was not always a very clear thinker, I have to say, because <laughs> I didn't understand exactly what he meant, because Wolf Tone was separated from the famine because he was, he, he was born and died far before it, you know? And it was Eddie's interpretation, and a very, um, it, it's a fine piece of sculpture in terms of the statement, you know, that he made. But it was the it first is, in, uh, in modern history in, in Ireland. To be it's clear. actually a fascinating sculpture in context with this conversation because we're saying that nobody touched on the theme of famine until... Eddie Delaney uh, did, and there were Eddie Delaney was, others. Eddie Delaney was yeah. out there ahead of his time. Yeah. Maybe it was a lack of clarity of thought there as well. There's, an, there's another interesting thing, and it's a good say, sculpture. John, it's a uh, very good sculpture. The, um, the famine piece is, surrep is separated from the tone piece by this big screen wall of granite columns. That's right. And you know what Dublin Wags call that? Tonehenge. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, it's directly opposite the Gresham Hotel. So, you know, Shelburne. or not the Gresham, the Shelburne the Hotel, Shelburne. I should say. The other thing that's interesting about, uh, you know, we, we uh, uh, as a, a people, have deconstructed a lot of uh, statues in Dublin and in surroundings Including asso asso associated with the British presence in Ireland. Various uh, Viscounts and Kings and even Lord Nelson. But uh, Eddie's famine scene was blown up by loyalists in Dublin. That's right. I was a student at a protest down the road outside the Dáil on that very night. I can still hear the sound. We ran to it, and, and you know the smoke was still coming out of the remaining bits of sculpture in the ground. Anyway, that's a long time ago. Um, I think I'm going to have to sadly call all of this to an end now, and thank all of you for coming, and thank all of the artists for speaking and sharing how they got into the process in the first place with us. I'm sure there'll be a lot more to talk about in the years to come. And Quinnipiac sounds like the right place in which to do it. So thank you again for creating a forum where this can happen and where hopefully lots of great artwork will be collected here in the future. Thank you. Thank you.